You may significantly increase your risk for diseases in your gut, skin, and brain by eating gluten-containing foods, even if you have no apparent symptoms of gluten sensitivity at all. Now, a majority of people tolerate the consumption of bread, pasta, and cereals just fine without any apparent digestive problems. The problematic ingredient that has caused quite a stir or discussion in the scientific community over the last years is the protein gluten. And we've all heard about it. And you go to the supermarket, things are gluten-free, gluten is vilified. But, you know, what is the truth behind that? What is the issue with gluten? I think this is a very important topic because many people notice differences when they do not eat gluten. And for some people, it doesn't seem to make a difference at all. So I want to discuss this and why I think that gluten causes major problems even without us noticing it. So gluten is present predominantly in wheat, but also in a lesser amount in barley, rye, and triticale, which is sort of a hybrid of those. Now it is estimated that 1% of the population is suffering from true celiac disease, which is a very intense immune reaction to gluten, which results in inflammation and ultimately destruction of the lining of the small intestine. So this is pretty severe, obviously. Now this is an illness that usually develops in childhood, but it can manifest at any stage in life, really. A lot of times this happens where children that have problems with their development that are not growing or that have massive GI issues present to the pediatrician and they get tested there. They do a blood test and a biopsy and they can see what's going on and then they get diagnosed with celiac disease. And the treatment then is, of course, to withhold all gluten from their diet. But if you're not part of this extremely small uh, group, you might not be very interested in this topic. But what if I told you that this immune reaction and inflammatory process triggered by gluten does not only happen in people with celiac disease, but in all of us? The only difference is that for the majority of the population, it is so mild that it goes unnoticed. And unfortunately, though, over time, it can still lead to severe damage of our digestive tract, Skin organs can be affected as well as our brain. So we can get a lot of diseases that are triggered by this immune reaction inflammatory process, even if we don't feel the GI symptoms that people with celiac disease or a gluten sensitivity have. According to pediatric gastroenterologist Alessio Fasano, the gluten proteins gliadin and glutenin cannot be completely digested by any of us. So that slice of pizza will trigger an inflammatory immune reaction in your digestive tract, even if you feel no symptoms at all. Now, this is not a video that will tell you to avoid gluten completely, unless of course you react physically to it. I plan to have gluten once in a while, but I will limit it to certain types of gluten and I will decrease the frequency in which I eat it. But from a preventive health aspect, this might be information that can significantly improve your long-term health. So let's just briefly talk about what gluten does in our bodies, because I think it's important to understand this. Well, in the stomach, gluten is partially digested into a protein called gliadin, and gliadin is then enzymatically turned into deaminated gliadin, which looks to our immune system like a foreign bacterium, a pathogen, something that shouldn't be there. And this causes an immune response and associated inflammation. Now, this response also increases levels of zonulin, a protein that is involved in opening tight junctions in the lining of the small intestine, thereby allowing food particles and gluten pieces to enter the bloodstream. Now, in someone with celiac disease, this response is so profound that it causes an erosion of the villi in the small intestine over time. So these, these villi are the areas where the absorption of nutrients take place. And over time, these villi are destroyed through this immune reaction and this inflammation, and it causes a flattening of the lining of the digestive tract, which is actually very problematic. And um, it causes actually an issue with the absorption of nutrients and symptoms like stomach cramps, bloating, gas, diarrhea, or constipation, heartburn, and nausea are very frequent here, right? Antibodies from this immune reaction that happens in the intestine uh, can travel to the skin and cause rashes. And this oftentimes happens around the knees and elbows, but can be any place in your body, really. Now, gluten particles and metabolites can also reach the brain and damage our central nervous system. In a 2010 publication in Lancet Neurology, the authors state that in some individuals, gluten sensitivity was shown to manifest solely with neurological dysfunction. So these people had a gluten sensitivity, but they had no GI symptoms at all. It was all a, in, in their brain and they had fatigue, they had trouble concentrating, they had memory issues, and they traced it back to gluten. But again, no GI symptoms. It was very fascinating to read this. And a 2015 article in the journal Health, Population and Nutrition found that gluten can be degraded into several morphine-like substances named gluten exorphins. So they actually look like morphine sort of, right? 
And these compounds have proven opioid effects uh, and could mask the deleterious effects of gluten protein on gastrointestinal lining and function. So they're saying here that, yeah, you don't feel anything in your GI tract because it acts like an opiate, it acts like morphine, it acts like, you know, Vicodin, it acts like something that numbs the receptors so that you don't really feel uh, that you have this uh, discomfort in your GI tract. That's what uh, they actually found here. Now, as these substances are stimulating opioid receptors in our brains, you know, just like morphine does, just like Vicodin does, and so on, they are also very likely to be responsible for the addictive properties that gluten-containing foods have on us. And we all know this, right? We're craving donuts or, or bread or other baked goods or pasta. These are things that a lot of times we have cravings for. And, um, you know, this might be due to these, this opioid effect, this addictive effect. And books were written about this. I think there's a book called Grain Brain that goes into more detail on, uh, on this. But there's a real addictive property to certain carbohydrates, and it might be linked specifically to uh, wheat-containing uh, uh, wheat and gluten products. And this, of course, then contributes to overeating, cravings, withdrawal, and weight gain. Now, celiac disease, again, can be diagnosed with a blood test and a biopsy of the lining of the small intestine. But not everyone having a strong reaction to gluten has actual celiac disease. It is estimated that 6% of the population have what we call the gluten sensitivity. And here the difference is that when we test them, when we do a blood test and we do a biopsy of the lining of the small intestine, they're negative. So they don't have um, the same findings that we see in true celiac disease. But they still have similar symptoms. You know, stomach cramps, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, fatigue when they eat gluten, right? And um, before someone points this out, I want to mention here, of course, that there are other nutrients commonly known as FODMAPs, which is an acronym for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols that can cause similar symptoms. Now, you may know some of those uh, already. It seems like a weird acronym, but a disaccharide that most people know is lactose, for example. And you know many people that are lactose intolerant. So it means when they consume milk products, they get gas, bloating, diarrhea, they don't feel good. And that's because this uh, lactose is a disaccharide, it's a double sugar that needs to be split during the digestive process into two single sugars with an enzyme called lactase. And if we don't make enough of this, either genetically or through aging and you know, not having enough in our digestive tract from this, then this molecule cannot be broken down and cannot be absorbed because this double sugar is too big to be absorbed in the small intestine and then it travels to the large intestine and their bacteria will digest it. They will eat it up, digest it, and produce a massive amount of gas and other things in the process, which of course causes bloating and, and, and stomach cramps and gas and all these kind of things. So not as dangerous in my opinion as glutens are because this does not really trigger this immune reaction. It doesn't trigger the same level of inflammation, but just as comfortable and you know, not very good for the person suffering from it or the people around that person, of course, right? And when we think of uh, polyols or we think of these um, uh, sugars, alcohol, sugar alcohols, many people react to those as well, right? And these are things like xylitol or erythritol. And some people notice that if they, if they eat something sweetened with these sugar alcohols, that they have similar reactions, similar GI symptoms. And my, recommend, my recommendation is always is if you have GI issues, if you have uh, cramps, bloating, diarrhea, and you don't really know what it is, and most of us won't know this easily, Cut out both. Cut out gluten. Cut, cut out gluten. Cut out FODMAPs. Um, if your symptoms improve after a while, then you can reintroduce things one at a time, and it'll kind of tell you what it is. But again, as for gluten, and I mentioned this later again, I will sort of at least decrease your consumption of it from a health perspective, even if this is not something that makes you have these GI symptoms, right? Now, since many uh, gluten-containing foods also contain high amounts of FODMAPs, so sometimes when people are cutting out uh, gluten, they often improve their symptoms in uh, uh, the GI symptoms, and that is because they're FODMAP sensitive, obviously, right? Now, the majority of the population that is not gassy and crampy after eating bread and pasta is probably not giving gluten a second thought, and I really used to be one of them. I thought the gluten craze is way out of blown out of proportion and I thought it was just a weird trend at best. You see all these products in supermarket advertising for it. Of course, the industry jumps on these trends. And I thought, ah, that's just a trend. And, you know, most people are fine. I don't think we have any issues with gluten, right? But I first noticed that, that I felt significantly better after cutting out gluten when I followed a ketogenic diet. And this was uh, for about two years. This was some years back. And I did not really think about gluten that much at that time, but the foods that I was consuming were really gluten-free. 
and I felt fantastic. Uh, before that, I had very mild digestive issues once in a while, um, but I never really you know, thought about them too much. And then they went completely away. I felt great. My energy improved, um, concentration, memory, mental clarity. And I did contribute this mostly to being in ketosis, right? Because that's, of course, also attributed to being in ketosis, um, that you feel better, you have more energy, you have less cravings, and you have more mental clarity. And I didn't really think about gluten back then so much, right? But then I stopped being on a ketogenic diet. I introduced some gluten foods in my diet again. And I did notice that large amounts of gluten severely affected me. And um, I had sort of started eating these low-carb tortillas and low-carb bread. And I wasn't really ketogenic, but these products were available now. You could have some tortillas that instead of 30 grams of carbs, had three grams of net carbs, right? And same with bread. You can buy bread that is uh, sort of uh, ketogenic bread. And this affected me severely. And then when I read the label, it stated that uh, wheat protein or wheat gluten was one of the first ingredients. So what they do here is they take out the carbohydrates and they concentrate the gluten, the protein that we have in wheat, and they put that in there and makes it nice and sticky and tasty. And of course, this is a lot more gluten than you would have in a normal tortilla or a normal size of bread. So this was quite a bit of gluten. So it was gluten, gluten overload, right? And since it was so concentrated, um, I would really say here that, you know, the amount makes the poison and I reacted severely to this. And that's when I really put two and two together, right? But again, it's possible that even in those that do not seem to react adversely, gluten causes this immune reaction, inflammatory uh, response and leaky gut without any noticeable symptoms. So some people can eat this, even these uh, keto replacement products and not have any symptoms at all. But the question that always comes up is, um, why do we have a larger percentage of the population suddenly having symptoms related to gluten? And this is more in recent years, right? Um, I mean, we've been consuming wheat products for roughly 10,000 years now, according to some estimates. So what has really changed? Why is this more predominant? And again, many people have no problems, but the percentage of the population that reports feeling not good when eating gluten is at least increasing, right? And it turns out that the wheat that we consume in the United States today is very different from the wheat that we consumed before the 1950s, really. So in the 1950s and 60s, we started to experiment with wheat in the U.S., with a goal of higher yields and higher profits, of course. Now, U.S. wheat at this point was hybridized to a combination of different strains that are not really found in nature. So this is not genetically manipulating it really, but hybridization is very similar to this. You end up with a type of wheat that really didn't exist before, that we were not really used to, right? The wheatgrass is shorter now, um, so it takes less time to grow. And it does contain a higher percentage of gluten than the wheat that our ancestors had consumed until I would argue about the 1950s. Furthermore, our wheat today is sprayed heavily with glyphosate. It is highly processed. It is stripped then of all nutrients and then enriched and fortified again with artificial nutrients and preservatives, right? And it is uh, predominantly a hard red wheat that we're consuming today, which has 50% to 60% more gluten than the soft wheat that's predominantly used in Europe. Another difference, by the way, between U.S. wheat and the wheat in Europe is the time that we allow the dough to rise and ferment before baking the bread. Now, in Europe, most bakers will let the dough rise for about 12 hours overnight, and this significantly changes the digestibility of gluten and other nutrients. In the U.S., we usually go from mixing the dough to baking the bread in two hours. <laughs> so there's, of course, a huge difference here. And this may be the reason why many people that have sensitivities to gluten in the United States seem to tolerate bread and pasta in Europe without any apparent issues. So after experiencing an increase in GI symptoms after consuming gluten-containing foods over the last year, I would say, I have cut out all gluten out of my diet for the moment. Now, this might change in the future as I might reintroduce rye in my diet. There's some breads that are made only from rye. There's a Swedish rye bread called Vasa, for example. And this contains a different type of gluten than wheat and also has a small amount of gluten, as well as oats, which are technically gluten free, but they do contain a different type of protein called avenin, which can sort of mimic some of the effects that gluten has. And I would have to see if I react to that or not. I do think that I have some reaction to this as well. Plus, truthfully, oatmeal, and I talked in other videos about this, is not you know great from a nutritional standpoint. It doesn't have a lot of nutrients. It actually can decrease absorption of certain nutrients that you have. 
It is high in cadmium. I mean, it's not really great, but I do like it. And I think also we should consume some foods just because we do like them if you follow a clean diet. Because if, if you're too strict, you're probably not going to stick to your diet very long. But I'll see with oats. I'm not sure yet on that one. But I also plan to continue eating bread when visiting Europe, as I've had no issues there so far. Now, again, I always assumed that celiac disease was very similar to other autoimmune disorders like uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You, you either have it or you don't. But when it comes to gluten, there seems to be a spectrum of inflammatory response in the population, really. And again, all of us are somewhat affected, right? The most shocking thing that I discovered is that, that every single person is sort of responding with this inflammatory immune reaction to gluten to some degree. and might be very mild in some people, but might be more severe and really severe in others, right? It also seems that as we get older, our response to gluten and FODMAPs, remember things like lactose and so on, increases. So my patient population, I frequently see people that report having no issues with uh, the ingredients with gluten and FODMAPs when they were younger, but they're now suffering from GI issues whenever they eat large amounts of bread, pasta, dairy, and so on, right? We also know that malabsorption of nutrients um, are common in older uh, people. Vitamin B12 is a good example here. Many geriatric patients frequently have to get vitamin B12 injections as their absorption of this vitamin from food and even supplements is, through the digestive tract is extremely limited. And this can lead to anemia and immune issues if it's left untreated. Now, and how far our lifelong consumption of gluten in the form of wheat products contributes to this dysfunction of the digestive tract is very difficult to estimate. But in my opinion, it certainly plays a large role. So if you think about it, if we are eating uh, wheat, if we're eating gluten through our lives, and we know that there is at least a mild inflammatory and immune reaction you know, that concerns the lining of the small intestine, it is just feasible that over time there's damage, right? So there's a continuous irritation as we consume these products. Most of us Americans consume a lot of it. They actually did an interesting comparison. So between the US and Japan, we are consuming about the same amount of grain per year per person. However, the distribution is very different. In Japan, I think it was about one quarter uh, wheat and uh, you know three quarters rice, which does not have gluten. In the US, it's just the other way around. And so we have a very large amount of consumption of wheat. And of course, our wheat is very heavy in gluten. So that might explain why we have more obesity, why we have more disease, why we have more digestive issues. And uh, again, why people in Japan generally are healthier in those respects. So now what is the solution here? I am currently limiting my carbohydrates to berries, rice and beans. And I replace my morning bagel with organic rice cakes, which I actually like. Um, and oatmeal with cream of rice occasionally. That's something you can do as well. Cream of rice only really has rice as an ingredient. And again, rice does not have gluten. Now, at some point, as I mentioned, I may switch to regular oatmeal again, but um, this transition to the foods I'm eating right now was actually fairly easy for me because I was not really consuming other gluten-containing products other than you know, bagels and maybe the oats again. But this has tremendously improved my GI symptoms. You know, there's no more bloating, cramps, and other issues. I also noticed a significant increase in energy and less fatigue during the day. Mental clarity also seems to have improved, although this could, of course, be accredited to supplements like methylene blue, which I'm also taking, right? Now, for someone not noticing any symptoms on eating gluten, I would still recommend to decrease the quantity and frequency of eating foods like bread, pasta, cereals, and so on. Having a few gluten-free days every week will lower the inflammation in your digestive tract and may greatly improve long-term health. You may also feel that your cravings for carbohydrates are decreasing and your energy and mental clarity improve. If you got some good information out of this video, please subscribe and leave a comment. I'm very interested to hear from people that have cut gluten out of their diet for whatever reason it was. If you had symptoms and cut it out, how did it improve? Or if you had no symptoms at all and you just decided to follow a gluten-free diet, what changes have you noticed? So please leave a comment. I will definitely read those and they definitely lead to ideas for future videos.